A new study in Scientific America suggests that there's been approximately 59,000 pregnancies resulting from sexual assault in states with abortion bans since the Dobbs decision. I'm going to break that down and what pro-lifers should think about that. Hi, folks. Welcome back to the Pro-Life Guys podcast, a show dedicated to equipping you with the tools that you need to have compassionate and compelling conversations about abortion so that together we can change minds, save lives, and transform our culture. My name is Cam. I am the host of the show. Thank you all for tuning in, whether this is your first episode or whether this is um, whether you've listened to all 250 of them that we've had up until this point. I uh, really appreciate you being along for the ride. And... Um, especially for tuning in on this, a really, really important topic of an article that came on it. It circulated through all of our CSPR WhatsApp chat um, um, conversations and whatnot. A, an article that came out in Scientific American um, on January 25th, 2024. I'll drop the link in the show notes below, but it's titled 64,000 Pregnancies Caused by Rape have occurred in states with total abortion ban, new study estimates. Um, and this is obviously alarming. We should be alarmed when we hear a number like 64,000 pregnancies caused by rape. Not because people are pregnant, but because these rapes are happening. They've looked at projective um, data and they have suggested that, that, okay, not everybody who is sexually assaulted becomes pregnant. They've accounted for that. Um, this is a devastating study for a lot of reasons. And yet I think that at times pro-lifers are looking at this in the wrong direction or, or from the wrong vantage point with the wrong things in mind. And I'll start with the fact that this study was conducted and largely um, processed by Planned Parenthood itself. And a lot of people will have the knee-jerk reaction of, well, Planned Parenthood said it, therefore it's skewed, it's inaccurate, it's misleading, it's bad, it's problematic, all this kind of stuff. And I'm not here to say, obviously, that the Planned Parenthood um, research wing is going to be entirely accurate or faithful in their description. Obviously, they have been peddling the 1% to 3% of abortions are performed on victims of sexual assault. I have spoken at length and very, very adamantly um, about how that statistic is radically skewed based in large part because of the fact that a huge number of people, if not the overwhelming majority of people who are victims of sexual assault never um, report that crime to anybody, let alone to the abortion facility that they're having their abortion at or the delivery room that they're delivering their child at or anywhere else. The overwhelming majority of people who become um, pregnant are not citing whether or not that child um, has a father who's a, a violent assaulter. Um, the vast majority of people who are violently assaulted and sexually assaulted never reported in the first place. Um, I hope that this will be changing um, to cross-pollinate um, politics and, and abortion with sports. Um, as a big sports guy, I am horrified every time I hear about stuff like what's going on with Hockey Canada and these five um, hockey players that are accused of sexually assaulting this young woman and... Everything that goes into it, I am disgusted, as I hope each and every other person is whenever we hear about a case of sexual assault. Um, and and it's appalling how it happens so often in sports in particular, um, because I'm passionate about sports and I, I hear about all of the Trevor Bauer stuff and about um, all sorts of other perpetrators and whatnot, and it's terrible. Um, that's my side on sports. I love playing sports. I enjoy consuming sports. I am upset every time I hear about sports um, doing stuff like this because humans are humans and humans need to make good decisions. Um, I digress though. 64,000 pregnancies they go into in the article that I, like I mentioned, I've dropped in the show notes below. Um, they go into a lot of their projections and how they came about their projections. And I'm not a statistician. I'm not a policy writer. I'm not somebody who's an expert, but it sounds very reasonable to me and based off of my personal experience and how many people I have talked to who have been victims of sexual assault, the numbers don't actually surprise me. They don't surprise me at all that in a state like Texas that has more people, I'm pretty sure, than Canada has, um, that sexual assaults are happening at that frequency. 
um, that of the, I think they cite 14 states that um, have pro-life legislation um, that kicked in. Um, nine out of the 14, let me look at this, um, effective in 14 states, nine of these have no exception for rape and sexual assault. Um, they anticipate that around 5,500 of these 64,000 um, may have occurred in states that do have an exception for rape, um, leaving 59,000 estimated in states without exceptions. And so many of those are happening in Texas and other um, states as well. They've got a little map indicating which ones um, do not have an exception. So Oklahoma and um, Louisiana and Alabama and Tennessee and all that kind of stuff. Um, you can go and check out the studies they are going to leverage this study to suggest that there are so many victims of sexual assault who are becoming pregnant, therefore we need abortion. And that is what we want to talk about as pro-lifers. We want to talk about how we respond to these insanely traumatic and challenging pregnancies. We don't want to be debating whether or not this study is accurate, whether 59,000, 64,000 should be 25,000 should be whatever. Any sexual assault should not happen. Any mother who becomes pregnant as a result of sexual assault has um, a profoundly, tragically, traumatically difficult um, situation that they're dealing with. Let's not debate the accuracy or validity of this study. Let's talk about how we should respond. Because what if the number was actually way higher than this? What if 64,000, 59,000 was a low estimate? What if we were able to get our, um, one of the goals of the pro-life movement of making abortion illegal through all nine months of pregnancy with no exceptions, and there were even more um, victims of sexual assault becoming pregnant? What then? Does that mean that we should open up access to abortion? Well, absolutely not. Uh, right? Because we don't solve even the most challenging of problems by killing um, innocent human beings. And so how do we want to have conversations? When somebody posts this um, article in a, a Facebook chat, when this comes up in, in conversation, somebody brings it up in a conversation at a work lunch hour or in your family or on a street corner or whatever, how do you deal with this? We're going to deal with it as we are going to talk through all cases of justifications in favor of abortion. They're all meaningful. They're all important to address appropriately. Um, and so we're going to start where all conversations should be starting with the justification, meeting people where they're at through common ground analogy and question. And so somebody says to me, abortion needs to be allowed because didn't you see there's over 60,000 women in just thir um, just um, 14 states alone that are becoming pregnant because of sexual assault Abortion needs to be acceptable for those victims of sexual assault because they never choose, chose to become pregnant in the first place. I agree with you. Sexual assault is one of the most heinous crimes in our society. Yeah, we need to do more to prevent it from happening in the first place. It is mind-boggling that it is happening at that frequency. That is a problem that is happening at that frequency. We need to prevent it from happening in the first place through education, through safe walk programs, through all sorts of other things. And we agree that we need to do more to punish the guilty perpetrators and and support the innocent victims, regardless of whether they're becoming pregnant or not. We need to be so demonstrative in our common ground here to help them appreciate the fact that we agree this is a gigantic problem that demands a solution. I agree with you that a huge, huge problem exists. And then we're going to pivot into our analogy. Imagine that a mother of a born child is living in an abusive relationship with her boyfriend or husband. And when she looks at her two-year-old child, she is constantly reminded of that abusive relationship or behavior. Once we get that woman and her child out of that abusive relationship, she's still constantly reminded of that traumatic experience. Would we ever suggest that she should be allowed to kill her born child to eliminate the reminder of that traumatic experience? If we're not going to kill a born child who may be a constant reminder of a traumatic experience, why are we going to kill a preborn child? Go through the human rights argument. Do you agree all humans should get human rights? If something is growing, isn't alive, if a living organism has human parents, isn't he or she a living human? 
would not make abortion a human rights violation. If necessary, you go through the personhood argument. I'm going to drop in the show notes below the entire roadmap for anyone who may be new. I appreciate that. Um, excuse me, running through this very quickly. Um, and so I'll drop the whole roadmap for effective conversations in the show notes below. But we are going to try to demonstrate that um, abortion is age-based discrimination. What's the difference? Why is it okay to kill a preborn child who's a constant reminder, but not a born child who may be a constant reminder of a traumatic experience? Well, it's because they're not sentient. They're, therefore, like, yes, they're technically human, but they're not a full member of the human species, something along those lines. Why does that difference exist? Why does that difference exist? Why, 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 why? Until it comes down to age-based discrimination. And then how is age-based discrimination any better than any other form of discrimination? Now, certainly, whether it's at the end of the justification stage, when we ask um, if we're not willing to kill a born child, why a preborn child? Maybe it's during the humanity stage. Somebody might say to you, because you can place that child for adoption. Because you can place that two-year-old, that infant, whatever they may be, you can place that child for adoption. And therefore, it doesn't have to be the responsibility of that traumatized mother, which it is simply brutal, it's barbaric, it's whatever, to force that mother to continue caring for that child as a constant reminder. And yet, yeah, here in Calgary, where I live, if a mother gets out of that abusive relationship and that child and makes a call to child protective services or social services of Alberta or whatever it may be, that child may be picked up later that day, right? And that mother would be responsible for providing the essentials of life for that child for the remainder of that day until somebody is able to come and um, embrace that child, accept them and place them within a responsible adoptive family. Um, but that mother is still responsible for that number of hours, however long it takes for somebody else to come and uh, receive her child. She is both the legal and moral provider and legally and morally responsible for providing care to that child. That might be Calgary, but maybe you live in a more rural community. And maybe it's not a matter of hours, but rather a matter of days. If a mother gets out of an abusive relationship, she's in a safe home in some capacity, but she's constantly reminded of this traumatic experience because she is caring for her born, born child who looks very similar to um, the father of the child. And it's a traumatic, uh, triggering her um, to constantly remember that traumatic experience. She is still both morally and legally responsible to care for that child until somebody else can assume responsibility, whether that takes a couple of days. Whether she lives very rarely in a remote part of Canada or somewhere else in a developing nation around the world, and it takes weeks or even months, that parent is morally and legally responsible to provide at the bare minimum the essentials of life for that child. Um, and we would be horrified and would acknowledge it as a human rights violation if a traumatized mother who had escaped an abusive relationship but simply deemed that she could not wait for somebody else to accept responsibility, she could not bear the responsibility of caring for that constant reminder anymore, if she killed her born child, we would be horrified by that and we would acknowledge that to be the human rights violation that it is. Certainly, we can have a, a conversation about culpability and the mental, emotional, psychological state of that mother. And that's going to be something for judges and lawyers far more capable than I am um, to discern. However, we're going to acknowledge that we cannot kill a born child, even if that mother is responsible for that born child for a long, long time after that traumatic experience has ended, even if she's living in that abusive relationship on and on and on. And we're, we're either not privy to the fact that it's happening or else not able to intervene in the way that we want to be able to, if we can't get her into a safe situation, if she's remaining in that abusive relationship, we're not going to kill her child because we're not going to allow her or enable her or empower her to kill her born child because they're a constant reminder of that relationship because of a poor quality of life for the mother or the child. Okay, so we're gonna common ground, analogy, and question. And the problem presented by this Scientific American study should horrify us to the reality of um, what's going on in our country, in our neighborhoods, in our homes maybe even. 
and look towards how do we solve this problem? How do we address this crisis without trying to fix it by killing preborn babies? That we don't fix this, that, that killing a preborn child through abortion is not going to unrape a rape victim, right? That's a horrifying thing to even suggest. We need better solutions that are going to prevent this from happening in the first place. And when tragically it may continue to happen, we don't solve it by killing a child. I, I think often I was talking recently with my colleague Blaze that has been on the show a number of times and with Vanessa as well, who's also been on the show about how in the case of sexual assault, you are starting with one guilty perpetrator, an innocent victim being the mother and an innocent child who is the result of that um, heinous crime. And abortion turns the formula from one guilty perpetrator to, and two innocent to two guilty and one innocent, right? That um, mother in turning around in light of the violence that she has been victim, she is an innocent victim and has been violated in a way that nobody ever should. But when she turns around and we encourage, empower, even um, direct her towards having an abortion, she now um, enters into a second tier of violence. And that's not anything that any mother should feel like that's their only option that I've spoken to people who were told that that was their only or best option after they were sexually assaulted. And they, I, I've literally talked to one woman who got into very, very deep spirals of Stockholm syndrome because she identified with the perpetrator and she realized that she was guilty of having chosen abortion for her child. And if she was guilty of such a heinous human rights violation, then how could she judge some the perpetrator against her? And so she had dropped all charges and had actually initiated a further relationship with that person living in an abusive relationship um, because of the Stockholm syndrome that came from entering into a situation of guilt. And so we need better solutions to these problems and we don't solve problems by killing innocent humans. Again, we're going to walk through the roadmap, common ground, analogy, and question. Go through the humanity, human rights argument, question one, do you agree all humans should get human rights? Question two, something is growing even from one cell to two cells to four cells. Isn't it alive? The living organism has human parents. Isn't he or she a living human? And finally, wouldn't that make abortion a human rights violation? If they say it's a human being, but not a human rights violation. Okay, what is the difference? Why does that difference exist? Why is age-based discrimination any better than any other form of discrimination? Thanks, Tan, for tuning in. I hope that that makes sense. Please do let me know if you have questions, if you have concerns, if you have feedback or thoughts on this episode or any other. Uh, my goal is to be able to um, talk through in a, a real world kind of way. These are the conversations that I'm having on street corners and on doorsteps. If you're having different ones, if you are implementing this roadmap and it's not resonating, I want to hear from you. I want to talk through changes that can be made either on your end or on my end, ways that we can change hearts and minds because that's what we are all about. And so please don't forget to like and subscribe to the show. Give us a rating and review. Um, if you'd be so kind, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Check us out there. Check out more recent episodes. And may God bless you abundantly wherever you're at, however many hours are left in your day. Mm -hmm.